Hello, my name is Robert Arada. Where and when were you born? Memphis, Tennessee, March the 24th, 1922. So how old are you right now? 95. Do you feel like you're 95? Some days I do. Some days I don't. What is it like to be 95 physically? Physically, it's like your body has been here a long time and it's just about wore out. What branch of the service were you in during World War II? In World War II, I was in the United States Marine Corps. What division, regiment, and company were you in? I was in B Company, 1st Battalion, 9th Regiment, 3rd Marine Division. And what was your specific role in Company B? I was in the machine gun squad, which machine gunner. And what kind of machine gun did you guys use? 30 caliber, water cool, and air cool. What did you think about? Thirty caliber machine gun. It's a mighty good weapon. It'll do the job. And give me an idea. What kind of targets are the machine gunners usually being used to take out? Usually, it's when they uh, have have the enemy charging. The machine gun uh, is in a good weapon at that time. Like the Japanese bonsai charges. Right. Because it can cut down a lot of the enemy. Right. Were you guys ever used against bonsai charges? I was only in one bonsai charge. That was on Guam. Yeah, we used it there. Can you tell me about the bonsai charge you were in on Guam? Well, we knew it was coming because we could hear them on the other side of the mountain getting all charged up. I guess they was getting drunk, I don't know. But uh, it happened about 3 o'clock in the morning that they started hollering and charging through us. Some of them got through all the way down to the beach and uh, hit the uh, people on the beach. And we cut them down when they started back up. But uh, that was the only bonsai charge I was in. What do you remember seeing as the Japanese soldiers were rushing you all? All we could see was a bunch of uniforms coming towards us. The only thing I re keep uh, reminded of thinking about was the next morning I looked out my box hole and there was a, a boot with a shoe in it. Excuse me, I don't know what I mean that a boot with a, a foot in it and the, it belonged to one of our people because I recognized the boot. I never did find out who it was but uh, they had sticks, they had rifles, they had swords. A lot of them had, uh, was on crutches that charged us but uh, they were all drunk. So, what would they say as they're running towards you? Just a lot of noise. They didn't. I didn't hear them saying anything really that you could understand. But uh, that was the only bonsai charge I was in. So we'll talk a little more about that later on. Yeah. But tell me, what islands did you see combat on during World War II? Bougainville. Guam and Iwo Jima. And what was the highest rank 
you achieved by the time you left the service? Was the same one, PFC, private first class. And tell me, uh, you were born in Memphis. Right. Did you grow up in Memphis? Yeah. What kind of things did you do for fun when you were growing up as a kid? Well, <laughs> when I was a kid, that was a, the uh, depression years. There wasn't much we could do. We made our own toys. We, uh, well, of course, we had skates. We skated a lot. But uh, most of the time, we, we made our own toys because Mother and Daddy couldn't afford them. So that's the way we were, uh, I was, grew up. What was your father's profession? He was a, uh, he worked for Lion Oil Company. He worked on uh, gasoline pumps and stuff, and anything that the station needed to be worked on, he worked on those. I worked with him during the summer, so. Can you tell me about the struggles your family faced during the Great Depression? Well, my father sometimes worked two jobs in order to feed his family. There was 12 of us children, so uh, it took a lot to feed us. We didn't have very much, but whatever we had, we had plenty of. So sometimes he'd take odd jobs. Were there times that you went hungry? No. No, never. Were there any specific instances, things that you saw or heard around you that really made you realize there was a Great Depression going on? Yeah, when you, they had what they call soup lines, where people would line up for soup or whatever they had. Uh, there was a lot of a uh, lot of people that probably did go hungry, but uh, every, everything was. As a kid, you really didn't realize it as much as grown-ups did. You know, people who had families, but uh, you did what you had to do. You cut yards or you picked up bottles and sold them, or whatever, you know. What were the first legitimate jobs you had growing up? Or was your first job in the service? In the service? No, I'm saying, I mean, you talked about cutting grass and right. working with your dad. Did you have any other jobs? No, uh-uh. No. And when you were a teenager, and you and your buddies would get together, what kind of mischief would you guys get into? Uh, we tried not to get into it. Not even on Halloween? Oh, we might disarrange some furniture, you know, uh, lawn furniture, stuff like that. Did you ever soap a window? No, never. We didn't even know what that was. I thought that was all the rage back then. No. Nah. No. Nah. What about knocking the outhouses down? Nope. Never did that. So you were a goody two shoes? Well, I guess so. I was scared of my, <laughs> my mother. <laughs> what did you want to do with your life before the war broke out? What were you planning on doing with your life? That's a good question. I had the slightest idea. Work, I guess. Find a job. 
But that's uh, that's the only thing I can think of. How did you hear about the attack on Pearl Harbor? I had been out, and when I came in, they had it on the radio, and that's the way I found out about it. I, could, I thought it was just a joke, you know, but I uh, found out later that, that it wasn't a joke. So that's the way I found out about it. What was that like to know that your country had been attacked? Well, you'd really, you thought it might have been a, a joke, like I said, but, like, you know, we found out later that it wasn't, but uh, it sort of made everybody mad, you know. Everybody wanted to get in there and fight and all that stuff, you know. Take me through, how did you end up in the service? Well, I was going to join one of the services. So I went down to the recruiting office uh, downtown and the had them lined up, the Marines of this and this and this, you know. So I walked in. I was going to join the Air Force. I don't know why, but uh, that's what I had intention of doing. <clears throat> but uh, when I walked in, the first office was the Marine Corps. And I just happened to look in there and I saw three or four guys that I knew from the neighborhood. So I went into talking to them. And next thing I knew, I joined the Marines. And where did you go for boot camp? San Diego. Went to San Diego. There's about 75 of us uh, left Memphis. Uh, a couple of, after we was took the oath. A couple of nights later, we boarded the train for San Diego. And take me through boot camp. <laughs> boot camp was hell. Those sergeants and corporals out there knew how to do it. What do you mean? They would work your tail off. Everything was coordinated. I mean, this is going to, today, this is going to be that. And uh, they'd run you, uh, they'd hold inspections at two or three o'clock in the morning. And there's always, they was always on you, which I think was good because it kept you sharp because those guys, I admire them now, but uh, they were tough. Boot camp was tough. Talk to me about the physical regimen that you experienced. Well, they marched you a lot. They ran you a lot. You did uh, calisthenics with your rifle. You. Uh, You kept your mind sharp, like when you made up your bed that morning, you didn't sit on it or lay on it. If you got time, uh, you sit on the floor, you didn't sit on that bed. And it had to be made just right. So, and then uh, you had to school, you went to, and don't dare go to sleep listening to them with their lectures. 
but uh, it was good for you. Tell me, um, do you remember any of the punishments doled out? Oh yeah, yeah. If you did something wrong, they would, he would fall out of the uh, company and if you didn't admit, admit to it, the company, the whole company got punished. But if you admit to it, you had to do your punishment, like lifting your rifle up and over, over your head so many times, or running, and make you run a lot, until you just almost fall out. Well, you had you got good punishment if you did something wrong. Best thing to do is not do it, you know. And explain to me the saying, "You'll be sorry." No, <laughs> that's when you see some new recruits coming in. You, everybody, that's uh, holler, "You'll be sorry." So that's. Is that what they yelled at you when you first came? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, after boot camp finishes, what happens to you? We went to Camp Pendleton for training. And then uh, after that, we uh, went to uh, Auckland, New Zealand for more training. And uh, we left Auckland. We went to Guadalcanal and uh, set up camp there. And uh, that's where we did more training. <clears throat> when were you assigned to the 3rd Marine Division? Where? Oh, I was at... Uh, Camp Pendleton. And it was a new division? Yeah. So you were an original member? Right. Right? Right. Can you say that? Can you say I'm an original? I'm an original uh, member of 3rd Marine Division. Um, talk to me about the preparation that you guys made for your first combat experience at Bougainville. Well, we did a lot of maneuvers and uh, a lot of uh, training, you know, just made them, you know, landings and just about everything preparing for Bougainville. So you made practice landings? Yes. And uh, what about jungle training? Oh, we did a lot of that. Talk to me about the kind of things you're taught when it comes to fighting in the jungle. You, uh, you just do a lot of, it's hard to say. All we did was just go on for patrols, you know. We did a lot of patrolling we go out sometimes and spend two or three days out and then come back in. But uh, the biggest part was the landings, you know. So take me through your first experience of combat. Well, the first thing that uh, Reminded me of how it was. I uh, we had landed on Bougainville and was going down this trail, and I happened to look over, and there was a dead Japanese soldier with half his half of his head blown off, and that's when I realized that this was really for 
for keeps, you know. This is real. Real, yeah. But. Uh, was that the first time you saw a dead Japanese soldier? Yeah. Yeah. Did you guys take on fire going into Bougainville? We didn't uh, originally, no. The, uh, the guys on the right of us took on fire, but we didn't. We uh, landed and went on in. And about two or three hundred yards in, we were in the swamps. So we stayed wet quite a bit on Bougainville. It rained quite a bit. So what do you do when it's raining and it's muddy? Just keep going. <laughs> you don't do anything except keep going. What do you do at night? You dig a hole. You dig your foxhole at night. But, uh, if it's on dry ground. But Bougainville was, Lord, it, we stayed wet most of the time we were there. Do you remember any other specific experiences of combat on Bougainville? Well, we were, We set up every night, every day we uh, were, of course, on the move. Bougainville was, was uh, a good experience for us. We, uh, we'd see Japanese every so often, but they were hard to find. But uh, we fired our gun quite often. That, you know, they were, Bougainville, we, we landed where they didn't think we were going to land. We landed on the north of the island, not down where they were. Their, their base part was down south, and uh, we landed up where the sea bees had to go in and uh, build the airstrips. They had to cut a lot of trees. They had to cover a lot of water. And the uh, only thing we wanted to do on Bougainville was push them back and hold them back. And we did that. And the Army took over after that. But we was on this mountain, and that's where we wanted to push them, on the other side of the mountain, and keep them over there. And uh, evidently, the general uh, in the uh, Japanese army was satisfied with that. So they attacked us every once in a while, just to let us know that they were still there. But after that, we let the army take over and we left and went back to Guadalcanal. So when you're pushing the Japanese over the mountain, that means you guys were going up. Yeah. And they were firing down. Yeah. What do you remember about that? Just, just the firing. I just, you know, it's hard to say. Can you describe what is it like to have bullets going off around you? <laughs> uh, it's not a very good feeling. It's, uh, never know which one's going to be yours. But, uh, I was fortunate enough, you know, not to, not to get hit. But, uh. I, yeah. Um, so after the Bougainville campaign wrapped up for the Marines, 
Where did you go? Back to Guadalcanal. Did you guys do any patrolling in Guadalcanal? Yeah. Because I know that it was mostly secure, but there were still pockets of Japanese. No. Nah. No? No. We never did find any. So the patrolling you <coughs> did was for practice? Oh, yeah. Sure. We found out, you know, we'd find where they had been hmm. or, you know, some of the camps. But no, there wasn't no, as far as we know, there wasn't any Japanese on So talk to me about the invasion of Guam. Where we landed on? We landed on Guam at the north, north of Aganya, which is the city of Aganya. And uh, when we landed, we uh, ran across this rice field and uh, they were dropping mortars on us. And uh, we ran up to this, this hill and uh, stopped there and dug in for the day. And uh, next day we moved out. Well, that was after the bonsai charge. We moved out and started pushing them back. So that's what we did. And, uh, lost one of my buddies on Guam. He got hit, the, well, he got killed the uh, second day. And, uh, a mortar shell got him. He's from Memphis, Charles Minyard. Tell me about him. What kind of person was he? Oh, a real sweet guy. Real up going guy. I, uh, he was just a good guy to be around. He wasn't loud mouth or anything like that. He just, when I got back home, his mother invited me and another friend, another Marine, over for lunch, which was kind of hard to do. But we went. What was that like? Well, kind of sad. She was a sweet lady. How old was he when he was killed? Probably about 18 or 19. And, and take me through what happened though. Where were you guys? Oh, Guam. But, but where? We were, we were going up this hill and they were dropping mortar shells on us and he got hit by one of those. And, uh, was it like a direct hit or just some shrapnel? That I don't know. I didn't know it, but word got down to me that Minyard got it. Oh, you weren't with him when he was killed? No. Oh, Lord, no. He was on the left of me, but uh, word came, came down the line that Minyard got it today. So, Tell me about your experience. You were in the weapons platoon? Right. And you were on the 30, ma 30 caliber machine gun crew. Right. What was your role in the machine gun crew? At that time, I fed the machine guns to the gunner. And uh, what you did was 
you know, when the gun ran out, he put another belt in, and uh, he went on from there. Did you carry a rifle with you? I carried a 40, 45 pistol and a rifle, yeah. Was it a carbine or an M1? M1. They issued carbines, but when I hit the beach, I dropped the carbine. It picked up the M1. <clears throat> Did you get into any firefights against the Japanese with the rifle, or was it mostly just a machine gun? Mostly machine gun. Mostly machine gun. And. You know, the machine gun would attract the Japanese attention. By all means. So after you guys are firing rounds, are you moving and hiding to a different location? Or no, we stayed there. Where we set up, we stayed. Well, so when you were in combat, did you notice that after you guys were firing against the enemy, the, mor the Japanese mortars and fire seemed to be directed at you? Not really. No? Not really. I don't know why they didn't, but they just didn't, you know. On any of the islands that you were on, did you provide first aid to any wounded men? No, 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 I didn't. No, I didn't. And, and what would you say was the closest the Japanese got to, to your position in a firefight? Well, with a machine gun, uh, I guess it'd be about 100 yards, you know, of course. Didn't they infiltrate the lines at night? <laughs> Only uh, on, uh, they did on Guam, yeah, but, uh, they very seldom did uh, otherwise, you know. So, talk to me after Guam, what happened? We went back to, uh, oh no, I'm sorry. After Guam, we set up camp at, at, at Guam. And there we went out on patrols and stuff like that. And we, we killed a lot of Japanese after we secured Guam. There's a lot of stragglers that didn't know that it was over with them. When uh, you say we, you mean the group you were with when you would go on the patrols? Yeah. Yeah. Where would the Japanese be hiding? Oh, they'd be hiding in, in caves. Uh, some of them. Some of them would catch outside, you know, in the in the field. But uh, there was there was Japanese on patrol. I mean, found way after the war was over, five or six years. But can you take me through how a typical encounter would play out? So after Guam was secure, uh -huh. you guys would be going on patrol. Right. So take me through a typical encounter. Well, you you just run up on them, and uh, sometimes they would fire back. Sometimes they wouldn't have anything. Sometimes it, uh, they would charge you with just sticks, but. Uh, Sometimes they would give up, and uh, it was just, just kill them, you know. Even the ones who gave up? Oh, no. No, 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 no. But the other ones? Yeah. Did yeah. they usually put up a resistance even when they were like, you know, even when they're outnumbered? Oh, uh, they didn't care. They, they didn't want, they had been, indoctrinated about how bad we were so they were they wouldn't give up 
even if I had a stick in her hand. But uh, somehow would give up, you know. We'd just take them into a prisoner camp. And, uh, did you ever see flamethrowers being used? Oh, yeah. Where, was, where did that mostly happen? Mostly in caves where, you know, it run up with a flamethrower with a, with a cave and uh, use it, you know, most of the time. But, uh, so the Japanese would be hiding down in the cave? Yeah. And then what, a flamethrower would just come up and... Yeah. Would the Japanese run out? Some would. Some would stay in there. But uh, very few ran out. I didn't see it all that much. Didn't pay attention to it, really. I was still trying to save my butt. Did you pick up any souvenirs? No. No, no, no. Some guys did. Tell me about the, some of the souvenirs some of the Marines tried to get. Mostly swords. Samurai swords. I don't know why, but they did. I said I didn't. On Iwo Jima, I picked up a pair of binoculars. Yeah. I guess it belonged to one of the officers. But uh, I kept those. But I lost them when I got knocked out. Did you witness any Marines trying to get gold teeth? I never did. Do you think it happened? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I do. I wouldn't... Uh, there's no way I'd be doing that. No, no, no I, was, I wasn't asking if you did it. No, 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 I understand. Like I was saying, if you <coughs> saw other guys do it, but you didn't see anything. I never did see them. I heard about it. Hmm. And I know that some Japanese soldiers would play dead. Oh, yeah. Did you have any experiences with that? No, I didn't. Uh -uh. I know sometimes the Japanese would also have booby traps. Oh, yeah. Did, did you have any experiences with booby traps? No, uh-uh. No. Did you have any experiences against landmines? No, I sure didn't. They said there was a lot of them around, but I didn't have any experience with it. Were you ever strafed by the Japanese planes? Oh, yeah. Can you tell me about that? Yeah. Well, we were strafed on uh, Guadalcanal one night by this plane, which scared the dickens out of us. But it was, the way it sounded like it was coming at us, but it, it was three or 400 yards out. But uh, on Bougainville, we were strafed several times. Oh, well, ever on Guam, too. Did it ever hit any of the guys around you? Not around me, uh-uh, no. Um, by the time you get ready for the invasion of Iwo Jima, uh -huh. your machine gun crew, were any of them killed or wounded, or had, it's the same crew? Same crew. Every single man? Yeah, yeah. And I know you told me the machine gun was used against the bonsai charge on Guam. Right. But what other uses would the machine gun, because it's not like you can just run up and hold it. I uh, know. You need to set it up. Yeah, you have to so set it up. So is the machine gun an offensive or a defensive weapon? Could it be both? Do what? The machine gun. Was it used primarily offensively or, uh, or defensively? Defensively. Would you guys ever use it on an assault? Oh, yeah. I mean, but if you have to set it up, how could you use it when you guys are moving forward? You practice that every day, how to set it up. 
you can set it up in a matter of, of almost seconds. The, the guy that's carrying the tripod knows what to do. The guy that's got the gun knows what to do. So the guy with the tripod can flip it over his shoulder, have it set up, have the gun locked in in a matter of seconds. So, you know, you practice that. So it can be used on the spot? Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you guys ever run out of ammo? Not that I know of, uh-uh. Would you be charged, because you, you were feeding it with ammo, would you have to go back and get ammo? No. We had ammunition carriers. They carried uh, canisters of uh, belts, you know. Did you ever use grenades in combat? I never did, no. Uh, and can you tell me about, would you guys provide covering fire for the Marines? Oh yeah, sometimes we would. No. What does that mean, though? What do you... You fire it over their heads. To keep the Japanese... Right, uh-huh. Yeah. And what about crossfire? What is that? That's where you got two or three or four, or two or four guns set up. And they cross... They set up like this, and like this. And they can fire it out crosswords. And is that used defensively? I don't think it's ever used, really. Oh, you don't remember it? No. Uh-uh. Talk to me about your first experience under a Japanese artillery bombardment. That was on Bougainville. And they were firing on the beach where we landed. And you could you could hear them coming. You just ducked and dug in or whatever you had to do. But you just kept going regardless. And so. tell me, sir, Of all the places that you saw combat, what island would you say was the most fierce? Most what? Fierce. Uh, Iwo Jima. Hands down? Hands down. So talk to me about the preparation for Iwo Jima. You guys had made a base on Guam. Yeah. Or you made a camp on Guam. Right. Did you ever see the American base that had been taken by the Japanese? Because Guam, we had a base on Guam. No. I never did. But you, you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, I know what okay. you're talking about. Yeah, we are at Naval Station. Yeah, that's what it was. Naval Base. So, so tell me about how you guys prepared for Iwo Jima, and what were you told was the importance of Iwo Jima? We never was told. Really? That it was Iwo Jima. Uh-uh. We didn't know where it was going until... We almost got there. No, they don't. They don't let you in on anything. So they put you on board ship, and you're sailing, and uh, you're just guessing where you're going. What was the scuttlebutt? Oh, well, it's going to <clears throat> New Ireland or one of those islands. And every day it changed, but uh, later on we found out it was Iwo Jima. Now the Third Marine Division was held in reserve. Yeah. Because it was the four, it was the fifth and the fourth that right were the salt waves. Uh, but the Third Marine Division saw a lot of combat. Oh yeah. Though. So were you there for the naval bombardment? Oh yeah. What do you remember about the naval bombardment of oh. Iwo Jima? First thing about Iwo Jima, 
They said it was going to be a cake, cakewalk. They said it'd be over in a couple of weeks. We didn't even know that he had did what he did. The general or the uh, Japanese. What did he do? The first thing he did when he was assigned the island, <coughs> he went to the island and he found out that what he had to protect the island was a bunch of drunks, uh, low lives. He packed all of those up and sent them back to Japan. Then he brought the army in, and the, uh, he had he had plans on what he was going to do to the island, and uh, he started digging in and preparing for the invasion because he knew, he knew he was going to be invaded and he knew they was going to he knew we was going to capture the island but he was going to make us pay for it dearly so he started digging rooms in the island I mean big rooms hospitals barracks, and he had all of the, his weapons sighted in on certain parts of the island. And when we landed, he let us land first. And after we got in there a little ways, he started firing. And that's when a lot of casualties were building up. So. He was a smart cookie. So when we landed, we landed, I think about three or four days later, we were re relieving the 21st Regiment, which had already been in, and they'd been chopped up real bad. So they called us in, and when, I land when we landed, when I hit the beach, all I could see was wounded uh, wounded Marines or dead Marines. And I knew then that we were in a bad shape. So you kept running up this embankment and uh, had to cross this landing strip and then turn right to go up the middle of the island. So that's, that's on the landing of Iwo Jima. Tell me about the naval bombardment of Iwo Jima. Oh, Lord. They, <laughs> I don't know how many battleships it was, but they were all fired. I mean, they were, you could hear the, the some of the, the big, uh, projectiles going over like a freight train but uh, not only that they had planes we had planes bombing it too it didn't do any good very little good that that did because they were always underground they uh, they could probably feel it but uh, as far as destroying anything it didn't destroy very much. Just because they, you know, like I said, they were all under in these big, big rooms. So, but they threw everything we had at them. Were you out on deck watching them before? Yes, uh huh. Yeah. We were out on deck. Watching it go. I mean, what did the island look like when it was getting hit or pummeled? Just looked like a little island. No trees or anything like that. No jungle. Just a lot of a lot of sand, especially on the 
south end of where the mount was, Mount Suribachi. Suribachi. That's where most of your volcano sand was. You go up north, there's a sulfur, sulfur plant up there that they had. It was, you could dig in up there and feel the heat from the sulfur. <laughs> What did the sulfur smell like? Just like sulfur. Which smells like? So, I don't know. Rotten egg. Yeah. Now, do you remember the meal that they gave you guys before you went on the island? Steak and eggs. And explain to me the what does steak and eggs mean? If you're getting steak and eggs, what does that mean? It means you get the steak and eggs. But it means you're about to go on a oh, yeah. combat, right? Oh, yeah. They would, would, well, you're near there. Would, would, would you guys ever get steak and eggs otherwise? Lord, no. No. A lot of sea ration. Of course, when you was in camp, you know, they had pretty good meals, had good cooks. Tell, tell me about uh, what kind of food would be in a sea ration. Oh, you'd have uh, little cans of beans, weenies, uh, some kind of meat, cigarettes, candy. about it. Talk to me about your first experience of combat on Iwo Jima. Well, the first night, well, the first day, when we landed, we had to go up this berm, and which was awful hard to do because it was almost knee deep in, in sand. But after you got up to the top, you crossed the uh, runway that the Japanese had built, and then you turn right and uh, go up the middle of the island. But that that night you dug in, and it's just activity all night, rattling machine guns or rifles or artillery going off all the you didn't get very much sleep you just <laughs> was scared to death I guess but usually I had two men in the in the foxhole one could sleep a couple of hours and then the guy in the foxhole would you know, you relieve him. Usually four hours, and then all. But, uh, How long would you say you were on Iwo Jima before you were wounded? I don't know, about 30 days, I guess. You were on there for about a month? Uh huh. Were you guys ever in reserve, or were you there on the front for those 30 days? Mostly on the front. Do you remember anything about the flag raisings? Yeah, we were on deck, and uh, well, well, there was one time I remember that on Evo that. We were trapped out in front of our lines. Uh, our lines had pulled back without us knowing about it. We just happened to look around and we were sitting out there by ourselves. I had a machine gun and a couple of ammunition carriers, a lieutenant and a flamethrower. 
So uh, I told them, you know, do not fire. Maybe they didn't know. They won't know that they was here. Who? The Japanese. So about that time, my number one gunner got hit right between the eyes. And uh, I told them we had to get out of here. We'd go out two by two. I asked one of the runners to take the bolt out of the machine gun. So we'd pick it up on the way back. And I asked the flamethrower if he knew how to dismantle the, the, the flamethrower. He said, yeah. I said, well, dismantle it. About that time, the lieutenant said, no, we can't do that. We got to take it with us. I told the lieutenant, I said, well, a dead man can't carry that. I said, go ahead and do what I told you to do, and uh, which he did. And he got hit in the shoulder, which wasn't too bad. But uh, we started going out two by two. And I think the lieutenant must have been the first one out. So I never did see him after that but he might have been a replacement because we were getting a lot of those. So we started two by two to get back to our lines. And I was, me and another guy were the last to leave. So we got back safely, thank goodness. But uh, we were in a bad situation there for a while. How long did that all last? Oh, from the time we found out, oh, about six hours, I guess. And but, uh, what happened to the rest of the Marines? Why were you all by yourselves? Never did find out. Never did find out. I know we were, we were pushing up the island, and evidently they, uh, had something in mind that the officers had something in mind they decided to stop and then they pulled back to a safer location and dug in for the night. So uh, somehow we got left, didn't get word of it. But we, we were in bad shape there for a while. But, so you're saying that some of the other Marines around you went back? The whole whole battalion went back. Did, and you guys didn't get word to no, go back? No, uh, right. And so you were left out there? Right. Alone? Alone. And, and tell me, what was the name of your machine gunner? Barco. I forget his first name, B.A. He was from Chicago. I can't remember his first name. What kind of person was he? Oh, he's a real nice guy. Real nice guy. But, uh, and did you see him getting hit? Well, you could hear it. It sounded like somebody, when he, he got hit, it sounded like somebody fired a rifle. It got hit right, right between the eyes. How close was the machine gunner to you when he was hit? Right like this. And so he, you, he, you were right next to him? Shoulder to shoulder. And what do you remember feeling and hearing when he was hit? You didn't feel anything really. I don't know why. Just felt sorry for him, but uh, yeah. The only thing you were thinking about is getting out of there, you know. Do you guys have any cover? No. So the Japanese who picked off your machine gunner, how come he didn't pick you off? I don't know. Did you just get down, or? Well, I got down, yeah. But uh, you still had to get up to run. 
So you felt like when you're going to get up to run that they were going to start shooting, but they never did. I don't know whether they dropped down back in his hole or what. I remember this remember this tank getting hit and uh, catching fire and the guys that got out were being burned alive. I remember one guy in our outfit that was with us went up on the to look over top of the little hill there and uh, he got hit in the shoulder and he started hollering I've been hit we drug him back down and uh, called the corpsman and uh, he just kept hollering and uh, it wasn't a very bad wound, it was just in his shoulder. But he, he died. His veins collapsed on him. He went into shock, and his veins, the woman said, I can't get a vein. His veins are gone. He, he died with that little old wound. His name was Appler. He was from Brooklyn. He was typical Brooklyn. But uh, that's the first guy I saw die like that. What was he saying? Oh, I've been hit. I'm, I'm going to die. I'm going to be hit. I've I'm, I'm been hit. I'm gonna die, and all that, you know, just hollering. We're trying to get him to quieten down, but he never would. I don't know. I guess he was just scared. But uh, Can you tell me more about that tank incident? How did that happen? Where were you? What happened? It was on the right of us. It, uh, I happened to look over there. And uh, it was burning pretty good. And the guys got burnt up in there before they could get out. Did you see the tank get hit? No, I didn't see it get hit, no. So you looked over to your right. Right. And it, an American tank had been hit. Yeah. And what did it look like? Just flaming. And All that fuel and everything was. And then what did you see? Saw him trying to get out. Who? The men inside. But they never did. How, how how did you see them trying to get out? You could see a little head come up, you know, out of the turret and uh, drop back down. You mentioned earlier though that they were burned alive. Yeah. How did you know that? They never did get out. You saw them trying to get out, but you knew they were in there. Well, the flame was, the tank was burning pretty good, yeah. All around? Yeah. Were they screaming or calling out for help? If they was, I, I couldn't hear them. Why didn't anyone go to help them? You couldn't help them. There's no way you could help them. What are you going to do? You could put out the fire? How? Throw sand on it. Oh. Nah, not with all that fuel, no way. So they were goners? They were gone. But what was that like for you to actually have to see, you know, fellow Americans getting killed? No, nah. at that time you didn't have a very much feeling. Oh, you felt sorry for them, sure. But it wasn't anything you could do. Were there any other times that you saw Americans getting hit around you? Oh yeah, you get them, get them shot, you know, 
blown up. You saw that quite often on that island. Blown up? Yeah. When the shell hits a mortar shell or artillery shell, you know they're goners. Were direct hits common? No, not common, no. Did you ever see that happen? Oh, yeah. What do you remember about the direct artillery hits? We well, just see it, see it when it hit the, hit the, uh, hit the uh, foxhole, or, you know, around it. Foxhole is just a lot of sand and bodies flying around. Could you actually see the body parts? Oh, sure. Around? Sure. Well, there was one time on Guam <coughs> that we were, where we were going to dig in at night, we got there a little late. And, uh, I saw a hole where a shell had hit, and uh, it was pretty big. And I told my machine gun outfit, I said, we'll stay here. We won't have to dig in. So we started setting up, and the, uh, three sergeants came up. And my sergeant told me, he said, uh, we're going to take this hole. You go down further and dig in. So all, all you had to do was go down, like he said, and dig in. But about sundown, it, uh, I don't know how many it was, but there were some Japanese that came up unbeknown to us, and they threw a satchel charge evidently into this foxhole where the sergeants were and all of them were later died but there was one our, our sergeant he was from Oklahoma and uh, he was well I called a corpsman first and he went up there and he came back and told me he said, there's nothing I could do with them. So this sergeant, oh, I don't know how long it took for him to die, but he kept calling for his mother. That's the only time, but he later died too. What was that like for you to actually hear a dying man? Do you know what I mean? I was, I was hoping he would go ahead and die get it over with because we were he was a good sergeant and I'm sorry to hear him go but for him to he told me what kind of what kind of man he was that he was calling for his mother what do you mean by that? He was a good boy. He was good to his mother. And uh, what kind of marine was he? He graduated from Oklahoma. He was a football player. I think he played quarterback. But what kind of marine was he? He was a good marine. He. Uh, He gave you a lot of leeway, you know, but he was strict. Do you remember his name? No, I don't. When you were on the machine gun, when you were in your machine gun crew? Yeah. Were, did you ever become the gunner? Oh, yeah. What, what island did, were you the gunner? On Evo. I took over after my gunner got killed. And before you were gunner, you were feeding the ammo? Feeding, uh, yeah. Would 
When you're on a machine gun, are you just firing in a general area? Can you actually ever see your targets? Oh, yeah. A lot of times you saw your target. Well, no sense in firing unless you saw your target. So most of the time you saw your target. So tell me about the kind of targets you fired at. Just a Japanese soldier. But see, my understanding is that the Japanese were dug in and hidden on Iwo. Yeah. So how did you find them? They just pop up out of the hole. We didn't... <clears throat> To be honest with you, on Evo, we didn't use a machine gun all that much because there wasn't no, nothing to shoot at, you know. They would pop up out of a hole, then go get another hole. So what did you use if you didn't use the machine gun? You just, <laughs> you just stayed there. Use your rifle if you could. Did you personally ever get in a firefight against the Japanese? Oh, yeah. Yeah. There was one time... It was north of the island. There was a bunch of them got killed. We killed a bunch of them up there. But uh, other than that, very seldom you ever used it. Well, give me a little more detail. What happened? Well, they were just out in a, started up an island in this uh, ravine, and we caught them there and uh, killed them. They didn't know we were there. How many of them would you say there were? About 15 or 20. And how many of you were there? Uh, oh, about eight or nine of us. And so what were you guys doing and what were the Japanese doing? They were moving up this ravine. What does that mean, a ravine? It's between two hills. Okay. And, uh, and where were you guys? We were set up at the end of it. Waiting for them? Yeah. You knew they were coming or just yeah. no, we if they see. did come? We could hear them coming. And uh, as soon as they got in sight, we started shooting in. They didn't know we were there. Did you guys each like pick a different target or? No, just fire. We how, don't pick fire. How far away were they from you guys when it, you opened up? About 50 yards, I guess. 50 yards? Yeah. And how could they not see you? Where were you guys? We were, we were covered up. And explain to me their reaction when the first couple of them, you know, got hit and went down. What did the other 18, 17 of them do? They tried to get around us, but uh, they never did. But uh, I'm sure some of them, I'm sure some of them got away. But uh, we got most of them anyhow. The aim at the body, you know. You had your gun set up. I had a rifle, but uh, depended mostly on the machine gun. What is it like to have shells going off around you? It's scary. You never know which one's going to be your, yours. So, it scares the devil out of you. Were you ever wounded? No. No. I thought you were. Oh, does it, uh, I thought you thought, well, yeah, I was knocked out. Isn't that what got you out of combat? Yeah. But I, uh... So, so take me through, uh, how did you get off the front lines on Iwo Jima? I guess a corpsman. Help me. I got on the battle on the uh, hospital ship. And the next thing I knew, uh, I was going back to Guam. But what had happened to you? I just knocked out. Just blacked out, you know. We were moving up. 
we were moving up the island and uh, we were going across this one place where it was just barren and uh, I guess that's when the shell hit. What do you remember about it? Nothing. Nothing. So last thing you remember, you were walking? Next thing I knew, I was going back to Guam. I was aboard the hospital ship. But what was the last thing you remembered before you blacked out? The corpsman. The corpsman came up. And before, I'm saying, the last thing you remember before the shell. Oh, we were just walking. And then? The shell hit. Do you remember a shell coming? No. You never hear it. You don't hear that. How did you find out that it was a shell? Someone tell you? Yeah. It had to be. How else would it have been? And so then you remember Corbin coming? Yeah, I remember. I remember Corbin coming up. And uh, he put a tag on me. And then the next thing I knew, I was aboard ship, the hospital ship, uh, on the way back to Guam. What do you remember about the flares on Iwo Jima at night? The, the flares? Shows? Oh, they all fired flares. Through the but, Japanese uh, or the Americans? Yeah, both of us. They go off all night. Some of the veterans I've interviewed, some of the Amer Americans, they told me that Americans did not always take prisoners. Do you ever witness that happening? I know, I mean, when you're fighting against the Japanese, it was so brutal. Yeah. I never did see it happen. You think it I happened? heard uh, several instances. Now, whether it was true or not, I don't know. I know that the Japanese were the enemy, but did it bother you ever having to fire at them? No, no, no. Why not? These are enemy. <clears throat> you fire at your enemy. It's either kill or be killed. You see them fall if you fired and they fell. Say that again? I said if you fired and they fell, you know you hit them. You don't hit them all the time. I mean, you know, it's like playing, playing baseball. You don't hit the ball every time. But uh, you know when you hit them. You know, at one time in your life, you were a young, very physically fit right. Marine, right? Right. You could do anything. Right. Can you explain to me, after being that kind of person, what is it like, you know, to, to be cooped up in a place like this? Well, the reason I'm in a place like this <clears throat> because I don't want to be a burden to my family. In other words, I don't want them to have their life interrupted by me being in the position I'm in. I'm fortunate to be here. I'm blessed to be here. And I'm just hoping that when I come, God will take me whenever he's ready. Does your family know that you're in a place like this because you don't want to burden them? Sure. That's why they come to see me quite often. I have three sisters that come every week. And I have some brothers that come. So I'm, I'm a fortunate man. I'm a, I'm a man that's been blessed. At what point did you start losing the ability to walk? Well... <clears throat> my daughter and I used to go out every Friday night I was living by myself at that time my wife had died 
And uh, every Friday night, my daughter and I would go out somewhere to eat. And we started out one day, and I got halfway to the car, and my legs locked up on me. So she called a doctor, and the doctor told her to get me to the emergency room, which she did. And that's when I found out that my legs are just about gone. So, and that's when I decided I would go into the nursing home, which I did. I have no regrets. What life advice do you want to give to future generations? To be honest, dependent, and love the country. Love the United States. If you were to give me some wisdom for my life, as someone who was the same age you were when you were overseas, what would you tell me? First thing I tell you is to get an education. Mm hmm What else? What other advice can you give me for my life? As it is now? For, for my future, you know, for my yeah. future. What, what, I understand. Be independent, do right, among your brethren, and uh, just be a good man all the way around. Were you afraid of getting killed when you were overseas? Oh yeah. I think everybody was. Do you think about it? Not often. Hmm? Not often. But you did think about it. And what was it Especially like? Especially when you're going into combat. <clears throat> you was wondering, you know, is this is it? You know, and you keep going. But uh, there's always that fear of being hit or killed. So you just pick it up and keep going. On any of the, I mean, on the invasion, uh -huh. were you part of the invade first wave on Bougainville? Yeah. Yeah, first wave. Did you guys take on enemy fire as you were going in? Yes, at mortar shells. We, uh, there were quite a few mortar shells. And what do you remember about the casualties that the mortar shells caused? Well, some of them hit the, hit the landing ships, but uh, I never did see any of it. You didn't see it hit the landing ships? No. Uh, How do you know it hit? I heard about it. Heard about it. Did you, uh, were you guys the first wave on the invasion of Guam? Yeah. Because we were the only re only division on Guam. But I'm saying the 9th Regiment, were you the first? Uh, at where we landed, yeah. So were you guys taking on fire where you landed? Border shells in that rice paddy. We ran across a rice paddy that went up to the top of the hill. Did you go in on uh, amphibious tractors or? Uh, yeah, yeah. Higgins boat. You went on Higgins boat? Uh, yeah. And are you afraid of death nowadays? Nowadays? Not a bit. I'd welcome it. Why is that? I'm a, what good am I? I'm a I, I'm gone. My body's gone. That doesn't mean you're I've gone. outlived it. What? I've outlived it. Outlived, <coughs> outlived what? 
a body. No, I'm not afraid of dying. What do you believe happens when a person dies? If he's a Christian, he's going to heaven. And that's where I'm going. I believe that with all my heart. I'm a born again Christian. Do you ever have any doubt? No. Nope. I'm ready to go whenever he calls me. And I'm not going until he's ready. So. But. Do you believe there's an afterlife? Yeah. What's it look like? I had a slice right here. Isn't that scary? Uh, no. No. Do you believe there's a higher being, like God? Sure. 100%? 100. No doubt? No doubt. The first thing you have to do is believe that God gave his son. Mm -hmm. To die on the cross okay. for our sins and for us to confess our sins and accept Him as the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. That's what you have to do. Confess your sins and believe that He died on the cross for us, that we may have everlasting, everlasting life. So that's what you have to do. And when you did that, your fear went away. That's right. True. What would you want to say to all of the men who were killed overseas during World War II? What would you want them to know? Oh gosh, that they're being remembered forever. that they didn't die in vain. But there was a cause for him to give their life. What kind of person do you want to be remembered as by your friends and your family? That I was a good Marine a good father, a good husband, and that I provided for my life, for my uh, family. That's about it. <clears throat> I hope I did. Tell me a little more. I mean, after you pass, and your family and your friends, they think about you as a person. What kind of person? I hope I was a good person. That, uh, that I was well thought of. That I was always trying to do the right thing. You know. Perfect. Okay, sir. Couple quick questions before we wrap. Up. Okay. Did you have any experiences with disease in the islands? Yeah, I had malaria, and I had dengue fever a couple of times. Other than that, what uh, what happens when a, a man gets malaria? Well, <clears throat> they give him medication. No, I'm saying, what are the symptoms? High fever. High fever. You can reach 100 to 103, 103. 
even higher than that. And, and what about dengue fever? It's the same pr principle, just a different mosquito. And see, my understanding is a lot of men died overseas from disease. Oh, yeah. Did they die from the diseases that you had? Some of them did, but I don't know about the other diseases. But I'm saying... They could die from fever, sure. Sure. Talk to me about the difficulty of fighting in the jungle on Bougainville and Guam. Well, they're two different islands. And uh, Bougainville, there's a lot of jungle, a lot of swamps. On Guam, it was mostly in open air, uh, very little jungle, just open air space. It's a different type altogether. And can you tell me about some specific patrols that you went on? On any of the islands? Not much. Nothing happened on <coughs> any of the patrols I was on. Uh, we just run up on sometimes where they had made camp and stuff like that, but nothing, never ran into any trouble. And some of the patrols did, but not any of that I was on. No combat? No, uh-uh. Would you, would you guys be doing reconnaissance? Yeah. Did you ever, could you ever see the Japanese positions? Where they had, had been. But not where they were. No, no, no. And. Did you have any, and that's for all the islands, you never went on a combat patrol? Never. And do you have any experiences, or can you tell me about the experiences you had against Japanese snipers? Not a whole lot. Now, uh, the only time I <coughs> can remember snipers was on Bougainville. We were moving up and there was one in a tree somewhere and he shot one guy and uh, shot him in the shoulder and uh, everybody started firing at that particular tree so I never did see him or anything. That's the only time I saw a sniper. One of the men in our outfit got the Silver Star. What did he do? He run, uh, crawled out at night and brought back some wounded men. He was from Memphis. Do you think what he did was worthy of the Silver Star? Sure was. And during the battle for Guam, huh? that bonsai charge, Yeah. did the Japanese overrun your position? Yeah. Where you were? Not where I was. Down the, to the left of us. Could you see them overrunning the position? No, no, it was still dark. Did any of the Japanese attack where you were? Yeah, some of them. And what did you guys do? Mowed them down. Wasn't that many, really. How many would you say? Oh, probably 25 or 30. That's not many to you? No. <laughs> were, you were you firing or were you... Oh, yeah. My rifle was firing. I was firing. I, but were you, were you firing the machine gun or were you feeding it? Feeding it. But you were firing your rifle? It was what I could. What would you fire at? Anything I could see. But wasn't this, it was at night, right? It was at night. They had, they had, you could hear them. You just fired and hoped you hit one of them, you know. But depended mostly on the machine gun. And the next morning, did you guys see the casualties out there? Oh, yeah. What do you remember about that? They were laying out there dead. 
Or if they laid out there too long, they would just blow it up, you know. It wasn't pretty. It's just like a balloon blowing up. On the way back home, about 20 of us were put aboard ship with a load of Japanese prisoners. We dropped them off in Hawaii. They were all cleaned up, eating good. They were happy that they were alive. Did you have any experiences at Cushman's Pocket? Some, yeah, sure. Do you remember anything about yeah. it? It was a hard battle, I know that. It was at Iwo Jima? Yeah, I know it. What do you remember about Cushman's Pocket? That it was awful tough. It was, it was actually kill to be killed. Well, what do you personally remember about your experiences there? Being frightened. Being frightened. What did you see going on? A lot of shooting. A lot of people being hit. So. Americans or Japanese? Both. Well, well, what was Cushman's Pocket? It was named after a general. Uh, it was just a big pocket, you know, went around like this, the little hill all the way around. And usually, the Japanese, uh, did you ever see any of them commit Harry Carey? Never did. Heard about it. Never did. When you came home after the war, huh? when you came home after the war, uh -huh. did you have difficulties readjusting to civilian life? A little bit. Like what? Temper. Had a bad temper. And you attribute that to the war? I think so. Why? I don't know. <clears throat> I was working with my uncle and uh, at that time. And uh, just the least little thing would set me off. I was trying to get by myself. He had a room on the back of his, on the side of his garage. And he told me, he said, if you want to stay in that room, if you want to move in there, you can, which I did. And, uh, cause I, I didn't want to be around a whole lot of people. So I worked for him for a while. He got me out of the temper tantrums. Every time I'd fly off, he'd laugh. He said, well, does that do any good? So finally I said, you know, forget it, which I did. Was that angry person that you were, was that a different person? It was. Than yeah. who you were before? Oh, yes. Sure. So it had to be the service that... It had to be. Well, why do you think you were so angry? You, you made it back alive. I don't know. You made it alive. I don't know. But did loud noises bother you any? No, loud noises didn't bother me. No nightmares? No. No nightmares. Uh-uh. You know, the World War II is different than it is now. It's a different generation. When we, when World War II veterans, when the war was over, all they did was go home, take the uniform off, and go to work. 
and uh, it's different today. Explain to me the difference of what. I don't really know. No. I wish I did. Uh, all of this, uh, I'm not saying it, it, uh, it's not true, but it's all of this. Uh, PTSD? Yeah. I don't understand it. Like I said, it isn't. I think your generation was a tougher generation. It could be. It could be. Like I said, all of us were grew up in Depression days. And uh, we had to fight for what we could get. So, so the 3rd Marine Division was in reserve on Iwo Jima, but the fighting was so heavy you were called in early? Is yeah. Right? Right. Do you remember anything about the meat grinder? Yeah, a little bit. What about turkey knob? Yeah. The amphitheater? Oh yeah, I remember that. What do you remember about the amphitheater? There, there's a tank. We were up on the hill like this, and it just the whole thing was just like a, a playground, and there was a tank dug in right in the middle of it. One of their tanks was dug in right in the middle of it. Mm-hmm. And we called the bazooka man up, but he was, he couldn't hit it, he couldn't get one close enough to it. As far as I know, it was, as far as I know, it's still there. We went around it. It says in the history for the 3rd Marine Division, the most heavily fortified portion of the island that you guys tried to take was airfield number two. Yeah. Why, where, did you fight at airfield number two? Yeah. What, what do you remember about the fortifications there? They was all over the place. They had hills, they had uh, holes, uh, you know, in the island, in these rooms, and it was they had machine guns set up. They had uh, uh, 37 millimeter uh, cannons set up, and it was it was about the toughest of all the battles, really. But, but was the the airfield was it like an open land area? Yeah. So how did you guys go about taking it? We just took it. We kept moving up and knocking off the artillery as quickly as we could with our artillery. So it uh, all was left was a rivalman. So we just kept moving up. Did you ever go into Japanese positions? No, uh-uh. Never did. And as a machine gunner, if the Japanese are dug in and hit in, I mean, I've had veterans tell me that you couldn't, you didn't really see many dead Japanese on Iwo Jima. You didn't. You sure didn't. Very few. Would well, you see a lot of dead Marines on the island? Though? Oh yeah, you see those. What is that uh, like when you, when you you're on? The, I mean, would you see it on the front or only when you would go to the rear? Uh, both, really. What do you remember about the ones you saw on the front? They'd just be uh, laying there dead, with their ponchos over them, waiting for the grave diggers to come and pick them up. But if they had just been killed, they wouldn't have to haunt her. No, they'd just be laying there dead. But when you look at the younger generations today and how easy they have it, 
Can you talk to me? I mean, it must be upsetting to see how a lot of the younger kids abuse it, you know? It is. It is. And they'll pay for it, too. What do you mean? When they get older, they'll find out that how much life they had lost doing what they did.